Either because Darren and Mark didn't want to go to the pro trouble of preparing remarks or because they really enjoy being spontaneous and responsive, they asked me if I would interview them in this keynote conversation. And I said, of course, I would be happy to. And that's my privilege. So I have a number of questions that I'm going to target to each of you. Um, but I hope that you will join in together, contradict each other, challenge whatever you'd like to do, um, so that this can evolve into a full discussion. We will have back and forth um, in this conversation, and then we'll open up so that the audience members can ask you questions as well. OK, so this is, I just wanted to say, the title of this, Charitable Impact, Art Stewardship and Cultural Philanthropy. And it is what Charlie said. It's really about the why of why we do these things. Um, we certainly will talk about how, but it's really about the why. Mark, I'm going to begin with you. And I will begin with the obvious. Um, we would not have artist endowed foundations without generous artists. Um, thank you for your philanthropic spirit. Uh, you're one of a very small number of artists who have created their foundation mid-career, not at the close of a creative life. Uh, Mike Kelly and Robert Rauschenberg come to mind as those who did so as well. There aren't very many. Um, so please tell us about the genesis and the mission of Art and Practice, the LA-based private operating foundation you co-founded in 2009. What were your motivations, your inspirations to make this major, it's a major commitment personally and financially. Yeah. Um, I, I think I was able to do it mid-career because <clears throat> the commercial side of my career really took off, really, not fast, but I found myself with extra resources. Like I, with, and you buy a couple pairs of tennis shoes and you say, okay, now what? <laughs> and so for me as an artist, it, I think in a way it was kind of also pushing back against becoming static. You get the New Yorker profile and you win the MacArthur and you start to feel like a pillar, right? Mm -hmm. Everything starts to become like static. So for me it was a way of kind of extending and making it dynamic. And, and so what I, really my first idea with my partner Alan DeCastro was that we wanted to share. We wanted to share some of the things that I had that I had experienced, and I wanted to create something that wasn't about my art career, but really was this living thing that had a relationship with ideas and education. And I started, and it kind of came out of that. It, it had nothing to do with me wanting to make it for to, to, to house my career. That I, I'll leave that up to Hauser and Worst to do. During your lifetime. But Mark, wasn't it also about one, in some ways, a rejection of the idea of accumulation? Yeah. So the idea that what it was about for you was 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 accumulating things. So selling all of that thing, everything, and 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 in some ways rejecting both embracing yeah. the the commerciality of. Yeah. Uh, and the reality of what is going on in the art market today, right. which is as you and I have talked, okay, I've got a, I'm going to sell a painting because I, I'm going to buy a block right. in a Le Mert, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Park. Yeah. And so, and so yeah. you sell a painting, yeah. and in Le Mert Park, you can buy two buildings. Yeah. And, and so that's the way you think, because the other thing that's happening with you and art, art and practices, you're engaging in these questions of race and class yeah. and neighborhood access. transformation yeah. and access and who defines and who has, yeah. who has access. Yeah. All of that is playing out in A&P. Well, you know, and also one thing I, I really thought about was, you know you have the big mega church and they want to save everybody in the world, and then you have the local church that just wants to save the block. I'm more like just save the block. Like, I, like everybody doesn't have to do everything. I think if everybody just takes care of their neighborhood, so I had a very long relationship with Lemert Park. My mom was a hairdresser. I was a hairdresser in Lemert Park. Actually, the foundation started in the first building that I bought in the hair salon. And I just kind of wanted to, I wanted to inform and to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not inform, but have a relationship with the local. I don't need to do everything. So just so everybody's clear here, could you describe the structure 
of the foundation yeah. and its partners and how yeah. all that fits together like okay. a puzzle. So when I had this great idea, that, okay, one thing I also learned is, for me being an artist, I would say that you have to work in the, in the initial phases with people that you've had long relationships with that you trust. Because they're going to tell you no a lot and hurt your feelings a lot. So you, they better be good friends. Like Annie Philbin is a very good friend of mine and she, when I said, Annie, I'm going to start this contemporary art space, and, and she was the, she, the, the Hammer Museum became our first partner. But I had to listen a lot because I didn't know anything. Get my feelings hurt sometimes, and she's someone the mark. I know you don't want to hear this, but, um, but you got to do a lot of listening, and you have to realize that you don't know anything. So what I, there's half, um, so, okay, so the structure of it is, um, there's, a, there's three or four different buildings, and we have a contemporary art space, we have public programming, and we have, uh, we work with foster youth. Um, an education component. The foster youth component is we work with TAYs transitioning out of the foster youth system. They're next door to the contemporary art space. We don't do arts education. I feel like the foster youth, it's the art is the family business. It, it bleeds naturally. That's more of an educational mandate, um, mental health, job placement, GED recovery. But they all are interconnected and they all flow in and out of each other. The public programming is also, I was talking earlier, I think because I was a merchant, it's very easy for me to fall into merchant, lo local merchant culture. I know what they have and I know what they don't have. I know the lies they tell, the tax, you know, the, fa <laughs> the fake tax forms and not paying this, no 401k, no K nothing, K, K, gone. <laughs> Because if you have $1,000 and you've made $1,000 and you need $1,000, you're going to spend $1,000. So that sustainability, and my mom was the same way. We just, we just were nomads with the beauty shop. We just kept moving. The, 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 the hair salon was sold, and we moved to the next building. And the hair, we just kept moving, kept moving, kept moving. So in Lamert Park, it's a, it's, a, it's a bastion of local black businesses. And so when I started buying up the buildings, there were merchants there. So the first thing I had to do was go in and say, OK. We're going to work together. We're going to try to work with your rents, but you got to work with me. So you're not going to buy a car when I lower the rent. We've got to talk about sustainability, economic sustainability, and how to really become sustainable, really sustainable. So it's like part we work with merchants, public programming on this. Oh, so Esawan is a local bookstore that's going to lose their lease. So now, um, they, we remodeled, we, we kind of got a new space and remodeled it, and they work on the second, the first floor, and we have public programming on the second floor. So when people come in for a second floor art, artist talk, they go and... They go through the bookstore. They go through the bookstore. So your partners are Hammer... And the Right Way Foundation. The Right Way Foundation, which does the work with the, uh, foster, with the foster youth. Yeah. youth and, and we run the public programming. The public so when programming. you come in to give a talk, you're on the second and floor. And then this independent books, and, legacy bookstore. From and a barbershop barber now. And a barbershop. And a barbershop. But Mark, yeah. in some ways, you are Who would Mark not want as to go to community, <laughs> community <laughs> developer. <laughs> right, but yeah, I mean. Well, not, not, no, not developer. Mark as community um, trying to keep you in your job, you know. Try, but but not in, many ways, in yeah. many ways, though, and this is what's difficult, because you and I have had this talk before, there are not many artists like you and the Esther and, and, I mean, you have this special capacity. I just like to share. And Right, but you also, you know, what artist is going to run a foundation that is doing foster youth and redeveloping housing and building a public park and I mean has an exhibition I mean all the things that you do is pretty remarkable no. but I think what's exciting about it is you're laying a template for artists who who want to be engaged and and your template says artists have a role in community in place mm -hmm. and there are ways in which you can use your wealth because artists today are wealthy some no, of course yeah. I'm saying some, I'm, but, but today, I mean, the amount of wealth yeah. that some artists, mm -hmm. a much larger proportion than in the past, yeah. can amass is, I mean, you truly today have yeah. the, the notion of artist as philanthropist yeah. is, can happen when you're 40 well, years you really, old. But let me, I cannot say enough about you, you gotta listen. 
like I have learned so much about putting on a contemporary art show. I know what a condition report is, and insurances, and truckers, and framers. Is that and, a good use of your time? Oh, I, don't I know. you know what? It's, you know what? It's fabulous because I'm always on the front end. Mark Bradford walks in, and there's my paintings leaning against the wall. Now I know how they got there. I know how much that truck costs. I know how much those art handlers cost. I know how much. And for me as an artist, that is really, really um, empowering. It's truly empowering to go behind that screen. I love that part. I mean, okay, but that's because you're. A control freak and because you you know yeah, I'm a control true. freak you know I'm, I'm totally a control freak you know but I like to know where money goes but you, but I'm saying is you have to listen to people that know what they're doing yeah I mean Annie Philbin has been my friend from the very beginning of my show I'm not uh, you know from as long as I've been an artist and when she said, Mark, I really want to do this because it's James Irvine Grant, we're going to part. And they really, they mentored art and practice about what it is to run, a, to put on a, a show. Mm -hmm. So those, those things are, you got to listen, you know, you think you know everything, but you know you really don't. Now I'm going to hop in here. I just want to say for historical reference, Mark is an unusual philanthropist no, during I'm his not. lifetime. Yes, no, no, but no, let me I'm say this. Uh -uh. Let me say this. We do have the extraordinary example of Robert Rauschenberg, who during Absolutely. his lifetime had this wide array of interests around community Absolutely. and a whole set of things that were of concern to him and went on to, to build an institution that addressed that. Um, so they're, they are there. Uh, mm -hmm. It's almost like there's one extraordinary person through generation and, and having more and more now coming on. Theaster would be an example. But Darren, I want to uh, quickly shift over to you. I want to put the spotlight on you for just a second. Yes. And the first thing I wanted to say is I doubt that there is another leader of a major comprehensive foundation, first of all, who stepped up to the post from being the head of the arts programming division, number one, and number two, to whom I could put this question, where does your personal passion for the arts come from? Oh my, well, um, do you know, when I was a little kid, I lived in this little town, and my grandmother was the maid to a wealthy family who loved art, and so she used to bring to our little shotgun house in Goose Creek, Texas, these <laughs> these um, paper bags that were from the Piggly Wiggly and they'd be stuffed with things that the family would give her as their sort of throwaways. And so I had clothes, I had, and then I got these books, these art books, and then I'd get shelter magazines. And so I'd be wow. sort of going, oh my God, there's like another world out there. <laughs> and there's another world. And, and I just started, I just started like living through all of these art visual. books and, and, and the visual experience for me was captivating and completely enrapturing. And so that's how I started actually. I mean, there was no art museum in Ames, Texas, right. um, but, but I was certainly by the time I got to college, I was completely, you know, passionate about it. And, Everything clicked. Then. And it's been a part of everything since. So the Ford, Ford Foundation is, uh, is synonymous in many ways with the early history of um, cultural philanthropy in this field um, and has this extraordinary legacy funding the arts. Um, it helped shape the nonprofit arts field as we know, know it today, the theater, music, dance, visual arts field. So you are now diving in to lead a major re-envisioning of this work. You're pulling the hood up. What are the motivations and goals for this effort? And should we assign significance to how you're conducting this planning process, which means you have to tell us how you're conducting it? Sure. Well, I think what's interesting, because the Ford Foundation does have this quite rich legacy, but I think it's important to take a moment to understand the imperative that animated that legacy. And certainly my friend Alberta Arthurs knows this story. The Ford Foundation's work in the arts, which was so seminal, quite honestly, was the result of Sputnik. Yeah. Um, um, it, it wasn't because, quite frankly, there was this um, sense that, um, that America needed the arts. It was in part because America needed the arts to respond to the Russians on a global stage. And it's interesting that during the 1950s and 60s, actually, the little secret is the largest grant we made was to the School of American Ballet. 
and George Balanchine. And the reason for that, when you really look into the archives, was because we had our Russian in Balanchine. Right. And we wanted, just as we wanted to beat the Russians to the moon, we wanted to beat the Borshoi. And we wanted to beat the Minsky. And so we knew, as Balanchine and Lincoln Kirsten told McNeil Lowry, we had to have a great school, like the Russians did. And so SAB, the School of American Ballet, became the fulcrum for that. And that is why so many of the great American ballerinas, all of Balanchine's great women, were all Ford Fellows. And uh, it was having dinner the other night uh, with Heather Watts, and she was regaling me in the years of all the Ford Fellows and the effort that was put into finding this great talent in all these hidden places in America right. be because we wanted on the global stage to show the Russians that we could beat them at their own game. Mm -hmm. And so I say that to say, just as in many ways America is challenged in the global cultural landscape today, we are challenged too. Mm -hmm. So what is our imperative today? And for me, so much of that is about this moment of transformation in America and the world and the role of artists in that transformation, both the creative process, the, 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 the engagement, and then actually support for artists. I mean, what is it like to be an artist today, uh, to come to a place where you can't afford housing, um, where there is such a distortion by the commercial marketplace? Um, where there are systems that actually should be supporting you actually make it harder for you if you're an artist. So we're interested in those questions. We're also interested in how social change happens yeah. and the role of artists in that. Artists have always been at the forefront of social change and social justice issues in America. And so we're, I'm interested in that question. How are, artists go, how are artists today engaging in the issues of the day, which is what, when I see artists like Mark who are saying, okay, an issue today in our society is everything from the state of the family to gentrification, to the school systems, to our public spaces, to discord. It's all of those things that are playing out in the yeah. work. Um, and so we are engaged in all of those questions, and that's what we're doing. Yeah. And the new guidelines for the The arts? new guidelines. You want me to speak like a foundation person? <laughs> Sorry. Do, right. So the new guidelines. So we've just hired, um, I'm very thrilled, because I was um, able to, um, to steal Elizabeth Alexander away from uh, Yale. And, um, and, and so she has just arrived two weeks ago, and we are um, next year going to be in this uh, exploration where there are going to be several strands of grant making because we really are interested in exploring questions. So there is a strand around diversity in museums. So um, we feel very strongly that um, and the data from the Mellon survey demonstrates that the state of our institutions, particularly our uh, museums, um, is pretty appalling. I mean, when you look across most museum boards, um, most museum um, exhibitions and their public programs, um, and their staff, mm -hmm. um, particularly curatorial staff, you see very little diversity. And so there's a, we're interested in why is that? Mm -hmm. So that's, for, for example, one strand. There's another that is, that is about artists and what do we do to support artists. Um, we're also looking at documentary filmmaking in the, in the intersection of storytelling and narrative because one of the things we've recognized through our work around understanding inequality is that one of the drivers of inequality is the fact that we just have cultural narratives that justify marginalizing certain people in our society mm -hmm. and that those narratives, we just accept them or they're perpetrated just by people repeating them and over time they become wisdom um, and we act on that wisdom that is wrong and racist and gender-based and all sorts of things. So we're really interested in how the arts intersect with that. Yeah. That's going to be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> 
And I know that by way of exploring it, you've had a process in place in which a whole variety of people have been in residency and been mm -hmm. in conversations at the foundation. Yeah, yeah. And we're having, we've got uh, 12 um, artist fellows this year from Carrie Mae Weems to um, David and Rewind to all sorts of people. So Mark, let me hop back, hop back to you because you said something very interesting. The family business is art, but these foster children who are about to age out of the system and need support, um, they're going to be exposed to the family business, but you're not going to be doing art education with them. Is that what I understood? Yeah, not, not initially because the, their needs are so um, the, the critical, the, uh, housing, job, the, the needs are so critical. I will find a way to weave in what I do, but um, I almost, I'm more interested in contemporary ideas, not art making. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to shift the thinking from taking young people and giving them a room and having them to thinking about contemporary art as being simply ideas. Mm. Because that's what I think it is. If we can get, so I try to make everything more idea based. When I and I do talk, I, I work with the youth myself. I do some of the do's and don'ts for the hair, for job, for job uh, interviewing. You know, I can do that. And you know, I know what to tell them and what not to tell them. But but that again is, um, I just use my whole toolkit. Mm -hmm. I just use the whole toolkit. So you're not diving into art education, but you're diving into awareness of contemporary ideas yeah, and their well, ability to engage contemporary ideas. Sure, it's like if you take a, a young woman who's just been in the system and moved 14 times and has no self-worth, and you show her work by Barbara Kruger, or you show her work by Kathy Oprah, you show her work by uh, really women that have a strong, Carrie Mae Weems, or, mm -hmm. that has a really strong center, in some ways, you can use artists whose work has to do with kind of feminism and standing up. You can kind of use those ideas as, as a tool. Mm -hmm. So we do, we do do that, but not yet. It's only, we've been, we're on our second year. Just give me time. But Mark, I think part of it is because your identity is you are, you are an artist. And so part of uh, yeah. your education in a place like La Merc or South Central where you are is the fact that you can represent this is what an artist looks like. Right. Yes. He's tall, black, gay, he's, <laughs> he's all those things. And, and he's, he's in our community. Well, he's that's... not some figure that's up, uh, that we see at LACMA or at the Broad. And right. we, I mean, well, that's one of the things I wanted to. The things I wanted to do is I wanted. We're always the, only, the first place I found my experience with art was as every other kid. I got on a school bus, a yellow school bus, and I drove across town and I went to a museum and they whispered, "That's art," and I thought, "Okay." I didn't feel anything. I just knew that it was important, but it was so outside of anything that I was having a relationship to. So I thought. What if you bring the mountain to the people? Like what if someone going on their way to school absolutely just sees this space that at first they might identify it as being um, belonging to white folks. Oh, that's white mm -hmm. folks, that's white folks. But eventually they'll start to say, well, wait a minute, it's in my neighborhood and what does that mean? And you can kind of have conversations around what does that even mean? And you can kind of change the conversation if it's in their neighborhood on the way right. to school or to the bus stop or to pick up some churches or whatever. You know, they have to, right. they can do that. So it's just a matter of taking, I believe in what we do. I believe in what I do as an artist. I just want to change where we do it. Right. Well, and you want to make the notion that it feels authentic and not foreign, because that's one of the real challenges that anyone in museum education will tell you is, it's great to have these kids come in. I mean, you talk to Sandra at the Met, and she says, it's great to have these kids come to the Met. It's important. But it is, for many, an experience like that. It is, it is intimidating. It feels different. And it doesn't feel authentic. And so you're saying, as I saw when I was at A&P a few weeks ago, you know, people are just walking in and out and you've got a show of some Nigerian artist and yeah. she's there and it's sort of a hip hop thing going on and, and it's black and white and gay and straight and everything in between. And you know, it's just this really interesting scene 
that where everybody's welcome. And I think that's a very different experience of, of art and, and, and artists. I'm going to ask one question before we go to audience Q&A. This has been just terrific. Daryl, you talked, uh, Darren, you talked about the importance of supporting artists. So that's a very big concern of this field, obviously, of many people in this field. And it's fabulous to have you here today for so many reasons. But um, several foundation directors here today, those of the Joan Mitchell Foundation and the Nancy Graves Foundations, at the very least, are so excited because um, uh, their commitment to this has meant that earlier in your career you did receive awards for those programs. So what do you think about the proposition? Is it right to assume that artists have a responsibility to assist other artists or is no. that an overly idealized notion no. about artists? No, artists don't have a right to do anything other than what a physician does. If he just does his job. I don't, I don't think we should put anything on artists, if, um, anything other than make, to make their work. There are some people that will decide that this is something that they want to do mm -hmm. and they're interested in, and those people will, will, um, will do that. Mm -hmm. And other people that have no interest in it, I don't think that they have to, you, we never say to a lawyer, you know, you really should teach yoga as well. I mean, we just don't do that. I mean, it's sort of like, and also they do that with, with kind of black people sometimes. You make a little, you make a couple dollars. Well, you know, you got to give back. Well, I mean, they don't, it's not necessary. It's really, I, you know, I call it like the economy of sharing. I, I'm interested in that. I've always been interested in that. If I had a loaf of bread and I'd give sandwiches to everybody. I've always been, this is not, I'm always, this is the same mark I've always been. So I just think that there will be people, maybe more and more, that have an interest in this. And they will start some form of these artists run spaces and other artists that have no interest in them, they, they'll just keep doing their thing. I think it's, it's, it's um, what I like about the field is that it's plural. Mm -hmm. And I think that the plurality is what's interesting. Okay. I think one of the real challenges is the, the tension between promoting the artist. So if, if it's an artist endowed foundation, and, and he or she is deceased. So is it about promoting the artist? Yeah. And so is it about creating awards and, and recognition for the artist? Um, or, or is it about actually helping artists themselves? Yeah. So, I mean, Mark, the only thing I would say on that point that is slightly not in agreement with well, you is, is I do think that artists who who benefit do have some obligation to, to think about how do, how do I help the next generation of artists? Is how, it your, you, or you hope that? I hope it. I mean, they're not hope. obligated, but, but there is a sense, just, just as there would be, be nice. you know, think about today. I mean, if you, are, uh, if you are Jasper today and you think about uh, what, what the, the Foundation for Contemporary Art has done, mm -hmm. Uh, to, to think about how the next generation of artists, uh, what issues confront them, how do we create an ecosystem that makes it possible for people to, to still want to be artists. Mm -hmm. I actually think it would be really hard, I and mean, I have no talent, so, but, I, but, to, but to be an artist today, you know, sort of 25 years old, I want to be an artist, and I'm going to come to New York and walk in the footsteps yeah. of Robert Rauschenberg. I mean, good luck. <laughs> no, I mean, think about it. Where are you going to live? Who's going to, how are you going to um, make a living? So on that theme, last question before we go to Q&A. All sorts of people create foundations. We've got technology entrepreneurs, hedge fund, venture capitalists, wealthy families. Is it important that artists create foundations and why? Yes, it's very important because artists have wealth. I mean, I mean, it's no. I mean, it's, it's like someone said to me the other day, I was in another panel of, of African-Americans, and they said, how do we encourage more African-American philanthropy? And I sort of thought, we need more African-American billionaires. I mean, I, it was just one of those moments where I was like, <laughs> to spend their money like, on art, right? We need more rich black people. That's <laughs> how we encourage African-American philanthropy. And so, and so I think we need to, 
want artists <laughs> who are, I mean, and this is the point, we want, I mean, and this is why this, this program is so important. What you guys are doing is so important because we're at a moment in the history of this country where there is so much wealth. I mean, that's a meta statement that is a fact. And there almost, there also is amongst artists. I mean, again, it's a sliver, but it's just like the larger issue. I mean, we truly, I don't want to get on my inequality shtick, but what is happening in the art world is exactly what's happening writ large in America. There are two mm. worlds. There is the world of Mark Bradford mm. and the world of Hauser and Worth and the world of Gagosian and Mark and all these people. And when you are in that orbit, it's intoxicating because there is so much wealth. And then you go, you go out to Bed-Stuy mm. and you meet this 35-year-old struggling black artist who can't get a dealer to like give them the time of day and they're doing this really great work, but there's no way that they will ever be at Hauser and Worth. And you just think, my gosh. And the difference is so stark and so shocking, but that's the reality. So the question of why do artists, because the artists are rich today, and we hope that they'll be smart, mm -hmm. like we hope people who are rich in society writ large will be smart and make smart choices, smart options that actually make a difference in the lives of people. Great. And we have one here. We do, we do, we do. So, <laughs> so we're going to open up to um, question and answers from the audience. We are not passing around microphones. Oh, we are passing Just around yell. microphones. <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> Sarah Herta, would you introduce yourself? I'm before Sarah Herta, the director of the Graham Foundation. Um, recently, the Chicago Architecture Biennial, we partnered with the Astor Gates and the Stony Island Arts Bank, and so the opening of the Stony Island Arts Bank was coincided with the opening of the Biennial, and we worked with them to commission a major installation by the artist um, Carlos Bunga. Um, the opening night of the Biennial, we had about 2,100 people, no, predominantly no. white. Mm -hmm. The next night, we had the opening, they had the opening we shared in that opening at the Stony Island Arts Bank. They had 14 1,500 people, and I would say it was probably about 95% African American. Mm. And that's just, you know, within the same city mm. to be able to partner and have, it was just so evident that it was so important that yeah. this place exists on the south side of Chicago. And um, my husband and I, who just recently became the executive director of the Rebuild Foundation, had the opportunity to spend some time with Alan on the block. Your oh, you do? Yeah. Oh and, um, yeah. And one question that we both had, and I think maybe is, is interesting in the relationship also with Yaster's work, is we both wondered why you made a private foundation opposed to a public charity, which the Rebuild Foundation is. I didn't want a lot of people telling me what to do. Because it's there, as you said, I'm a control freak. Um, and also, it is a, um, it's an artist-run foundation, and I need to change my mind a lot because I don't know everything. And as I know more, I change. I mean, I, I, Annie, you know, we've had tons of conversations. And I don't, as I'm learning, I'm crafting it. It's like, a, it's like a painting for me. And I don't want to have so many people who are much more intelligent and have been in this field longer than me telling me what to do. Although I know it's the right thing to do, I need to find my way through it. And, and I, think, I think, Mark, part of it, and this is another reason you have so, I mean, Mark is, I mean, you have always said to me, I don't want Ford Foundation's money, Darren. I'll sell a painting. Not yet. I want, <laughs> but, but part of it, part of it you would say, part of it is because you said, yeah. and you said, I actually need to control this. I want to have people like Andy and I want to talk, but I actually, and I'm prepared to spend my own money yeah. rather than asking others for it because I need to work this out. But yeah, I, it's, I, I, it's I, the working, I mean, it's, it's the work, while I'm working it out, I don't really, although I had a, there's a lot of attention around my project and blah, 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 and people, while I'm working it out, I'm not that comfortable yeah. just getting it because it's there. I, 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 soft people, soft fund, people give me money, they say, Mark, I want to put this towards that, and I put it, but until I know more, I don't really like to... Well, there's a fundamental difference because the Art and Practice Foundation is not the manifestation of your art. No. And that's a very big difference. So Rebuild Foundation is a manifestation of Theaster's uh, cultural practice. But I, think, but I think there's a distinction because I think that really now they're moving into their 
they're operating buildings that are open to the public. That's a public gallery dedicated mm -hmm. to work that is not theaters. Yeah, that's true. So it's very. That's but it started as that. I mean, it started. That's and so these are things about how they start. But in a way, you could almost say that you would imagine theater would have the private foundation, and Mark would have the nonprofit. That's my. I, Another question. Small. Another question. We've got the microphone ready. Shy group. I can't believe we don't have a question here. Hi, if it's a question, this is Fariba from Lucid Art Foundation. I just wanted to um, reiterate this: is that Gordon Onslow Ford and I started a foundation called the Lucid Art Foundation. It was based on idea. It wasn't about my art or about his art. It was about an idea, and we have artist residency programs, seminars, but. Well, I agree with you, Mark. We decided to do it private. It's private operating foundation. Just because of that, we wanted to have a little bit of a control there. I knew I'm going to put a lot of my time. He knew he's going to put a lot of his art and, and resources. And I'm glad I did it that way because it's small and we are implementing what we wanted. Yeah. Whereas uh, if we had done it the other way, it would have been out of our control. So I, I think I agree with the artist artist established foundation is a little bit maybe different than when it's uh, established by... I, I agree with you know. totally. And, I, and you know, artists, well, me, I'm, I'm kind of sensitive. I, I'm kind of an emotional thinker, an intuitive thinker. Oh, that sounds cool. I think it sounds cool because if... It, so I, I can't have a lot of real strong professionals just lining up and telling me, Mark, this is the right thing to do. It may, I kind of have to just kind of wiggle and, and work my way through it. Although my partner is from the finance background, and he was a banker. So when I go too far off to the right, he's real good at like snapping it back to the, real quick. So. Um, That's funny because I had a question for you, which is do you see a parallel between your artistic practice and how you are approaching the development of the art and practice? Foundation? I do. I, all the mistakes I make in my studio, I, I could see that I would make the mistakes in the foundation if I didn't <laughs> listen to people that weren't like me. So yes, I, I, I find, yeah, my partner is not, he thinks more in a linear way. Well, you know how I'd like to ask, have some, Annie, ask, you should ask a question. My God, we've been working together for two, ah, she's like, Mark. I mean, I'm just curious, like working with me for the last two years, just, because. Take a zinger. I think one of the heroes in this situation was the James Irvine Foundation. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. basically, Mark took on paying for all of this real estate and his entire staff, and, but he couldn't possibly have taken care of the hammer, and we weren't gonna take money from him. But every single department in my museum worked with him, yeah. from communications to curatorial to registrarial to development, even yeah. though he wasn't interested in development quite yet. We were like, you will be, so let's have some talks around this. But this was a three-year grant from the yeah. Irvine Foundation right. that right. paid for us to do right. this work with him. And I think that's a very important right. fact, actually. It's hugely important, Annie, and this, you know, I know this is not a group of museum directors, or, but this is a real challenge when I spoke earlier about the questions that we are looking at at Ford, and that is what is the role of the museum in society today? Because what you were doing with, with Irvine was the, was the question of, of transformation of the idea, and obviously your remarkable leadership of the hammer has represented this idea of, of really rejecting the notion of the elite institution at the steps and you, if you're lucky, you get to walk up the steps and yeah. at the top of it rests a curator who, if you're lucky, will wave their wand over you and make you smart um, and, and, and allow you two to join their elite circle. So what you've actually said at the Hammer is that the Hammer is, actually that's not your idea yeah. of what a museum is. Unfortunately, I think in American society today, we, we have too many museums who still hold on to the notion that th their role as a, is to be this elite educational body that imparts knowledge on the masses. I mean, this notion. And of course, it's important to add, we learned as much from Mark well, exactly. as they learned from us. Right. It but, it, but it was huge to have the banners 
in Lamert Park, which is a which is a 95% all black community, Hammer Museum um, PR for their shows and the Hammer Museum being on site in the exhibition space, all on the wall didactics. And it really influenced the community because it breaks down this, oh, it breaks down the racial Absolutely. thing because they're here. They're, they're here, they're physically here and they're interacting every day. I tell you, partnering and listening is a huge, can be very, it can go very good or very bad. In our case, it went very, very good because it's a West Side institution, but it does have a three-year commitment to, the, uh, to this local area. It absolutely, I think it, and then you saw the flow going to the Hammer Museum from the Mert Park. And when I walk around the community, everyone knows what the Hammer Museum is now. Oh yes, the Hammer Museum. You own that, right? No, I don't own it. <laughs> But there's, a, there's an understanding, and that's why I started art and practice, access, access. The same, like me as a kid, walking down the street and moving into a space that was a hammer museum and finding contemporary art, contemporary ideas that were less traditional, maybe a little more outside the box in my community. Because the next Darren, or the next Mark, who's a little outside the box, that's where we find ourselves in these little safe spaces before we have to get on the bus and go outside. And that's for me why I built Art and Practice, is to create a non-traditional, free-thinking, liberal, all-encompassing space within a local traditional black community. I think that the idea of things being plural from within is very important. When we racialize all black, all this, all, we want it all to be the same. I love the fact that diversity can happen from within. And that's all art and practice is, is you can wave your little strange freak flag here. And you do so well. <laughs> OK. Um, we have one more question, and I have a closing question if we don't. All right, we can look at the world in our communities, and you've said, Derek, we can see these challenges <clears throat> at the same time. We know the number of artists and Dow foundations is growing and wealthy number of wealthy artists is growing. Um, many artists are seeing their resources burgeon. What do you hope for for this emerging field? Hmm. I think this emerging field, these <coughs> artists can be transformational in our society far beyond the role of the artists in the past. So the role of the artists in the past was to be the tortured soul of society, was to be the person whose brilliance makes them so different and so foreign, and their life experience, which often ends in some horrific suicide. Watch or so, some <laughs> terrible, that, that all of those things happen, yes, but that artists actually and this generation of first generation truly wealthy artists can use their wealth for social transformation beyond their capacity to create beautiful paintings and sculptures. And we have that, artists today have that in their power in a way that in the past they, they didn't. I mean, yes, artists in the past had, had outlets they were and, and they had influence on society and on trends and through media. But today, the role of the artist is just, it's just, uh, it, it's, it, it's pervasive. so pervasive and so deeply embedded in our culture. You agree? Yeah, I, what would I hope? I would hope that um, <clears throat> some artists, not just if, if they choose, to, I always say, I like to remember that person before I went to art school. Like how, we always start to write the narrative from art school on, right. but that little non-conforming, uncomfortable person before fighting for who you are, fighting because you don't fit in, more artists remembering that would be interesting and creating kind of bridges, kind of bridges. It's not, once I got to Cal Arts, I found my, my, my tribe. But when you're that middle school 
uh, elementary school, high school, it's when, it's when the real kind of desperation can happen. And so for me, just, I would like to see just more artists saying, yeah, I, yeah, I wanna, I wanna save that person. Mm -hmm. Reach back. Yeah, reach back and then really propel them really far forward. <laughs> you know, like, like a, get them and then shoot them really, really far forward. Like, head of the, and maybe that's just my own personal thing. Mm -hmm. uh, just, it's something, and instantly when I got a couple dollars, that I saw that person in my head and I saw the struggle. The struggle for me wasn't once you get to being an artist, that's the great part, because you have support and you have peer. It's really what happens before, because it does, you know, they say it does get better. It does get better, but when you're in the midst of being nascent, isolated, mm -hmm. you don't know that. This is what is so wonderful about Mark and so many artists, because what artists do in our society is create these, these economies of empathy. I mean, artists, this is why we so desperately in a time of inequality need artists in our society. Because, because inequality in its worst form sort of asphyxiates empathy. I mean, it, yeah. it makes us a less empathetic society. Yeah. It, it, and so that's what artists do. Artists hold the mirror up and they demand that we look at ourselves. Yeah. And, and so for the, the challenge for rich artists is holding up that mirror to themselves because, because there are now so many of them. And, and, it's, and it, again, it's the same challenge for rich people in our society broadly, holding up that mirror and saying, how did I make all of this money so well, fast? We need to talk to some of those rappers too. And yes, indeed, <laughs> putting it on they are artists they all are, the time. Rappers yeah. are artists, as you know. <laughs> They'll be the first to tell you I they're an artist. <laughs> okay. Well, we've had a fascinating conversation. <laughs> I mean, could it have been possible to not have a fascinating you. conversation with these okay. two? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. back. Okay. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you.